to Canaan's land. I am on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. My friends, there will be no sad farewells. There will be no sad goodbyes. Where all is peace and joy and love and the soul of man never dies. A rose is blooming there for me where the soul never dies. And I will spend eternity where the soul never dies. Dear friends, there will be no sad farewells. There will be no tear-dimmed eyes. Where all is peace and joy and love and the soul of man never dies. My life will end in deathless sleep where the soul never dies and everlasting joys I will reap where the soul of man never dies. Dear friends, there will be no sad farewells there will be no tear dimmed eyes where all is peace and joy and love and the soul of man never dies I'm on my way to that fair land where the soul of man never dies and there will be no parting hand where the soul of man never dies sing with me now my friends there will be no sad goodbyes there will be no tear filled eyes where all is peace and joy and love and the soul of man never dies and the soul of man never dies I'd like you to take your Bible this morning and open with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 Thank you, Brother Philip. So appreciative today. God's many blessings. Thankful for my dear wife. All my children that are here and grandchildren. Love you so much. All of the members of our church and visitors and friends. Uh, if you only knew my heart, how much I loved you. And uh, how much I want the best for you. And uh, we're praying that God will bless today in a special way. We're going to talk about the sower and the four soils. There are four kinds of soil, and we're going to talk about those. And what we're going to see is that all of us will fit into one of those categories. So it's a little bit uh, personal and I want you to think about it personally and let's be honest with God and with ourselves. The Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, we'll begin reading in verse 3, He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now those of you who have ever been raised on a farm or lived around a farm, 
you know how that sowing is a vital part of the life of a farmer. You sow all kinds of seeds in the garden. You sow seeds for the grass. You uh, sow seeds for nearly, well, everything really. And so he says this sower went forth to sow. Nothing complicated. He's just going forth to sow. Some people would have a bag and they'd reach in it and they'd throw the seed and let the wind carry it. Some people would have more sophisticated things where they could roll it and the seeds would be cast out. But whatever you have, you have a sower that is sowing seed. Now, notice number one, first of all, or verse four, when he sowed some seed, when he sowed, when he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside. If you underline in your Bible, underline that, wayside. And then quickly look over at verse 19, where you will see this is he which receives seed by the wayside. And underline that, and then maybe connect the two so you recognize that. So we got the man that goes forth to sow, and some of the seed fell by the wayside, and notice what happened. The fowls came and devoured them up. Now the fowls here are often a type of Satan's work. Satan is always trying to keep you from hearing the Word of God. And he will use people, things, as we're going to notice, all kinds of different things he will use to keep us from hearing the Word of God. Notice verse number 5, and uh, this is the second soil. Some fell upon stony plants or places where they had no no much earth, not much earth, And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. So this sower sows and the seed here falls upon stony places. A lot of rocks. A lot of Kentuckys like that. And they had not much earth. And they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. So we would think, well, okay, they they grow real quick, but they have no depth. The roots cannot get down deep. All right, now look at verse 6. We see when the sun was up, they were scorched. Uh, The sun is very hot, and many times when the seed is planted, the sun can burn it until it loses its ability to grow. And because they had no root, they withered away. They just withered away. Verse 6, verse 7 says, and this is the third type of soil, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. They began to grow, But because of the thorns, the thorns very quickly multiplied and grew around them and choked out the life. Verse 8 is the fourth soil. But some or others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. So you had one type of soil that ended up producing and it produced three different multiple uh, blessings of seed. Some were a hundredfold. That's always wonderful. Some 60 and some 30. If you are the person that the ground has been sown in that is good, which one are you? Are you bringing forth 30? Are you bringing 60? Or are you bringing 100? The Bible says in verse 8, But other fell unto good ground, and brought forth first some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some 
thirtyfold. And then verse 9, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. As our Lord had gone about preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, He did not always find receptive people. And I want to tell you that the same will be true in our own service and ministry for the Lord. You're going to find, for the most part, uh, just as Jesus has said in the parable, uh, most times a seed will not produce fruit because it's not sown in good soil. Now we don't know whether someone is good soil or not. That's up to God. Our business is to sow. And the Bible says, if you have an ear to hear, let him hear. I hope you understand this. You will not understand it if the Spirit of God is not working in your heart to open your mind to see this. Now the Bible says, The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. If you are a child of God, if you have been saved by His grace through faith, then you will have ears to hear the glorious gospel of our Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ is delineated in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 4, where it tells us that Jesus came and He died according to the Scriptures. He was buried according to the Scriptures. And on the third day He arose from the dead. He ascended to the Father. And one day He's coming soon. That is the message of the gospel. And when you believe that message, it's a work of God's grace that allows you to see and understand, to have ears to hear. Sometimes Jesus would go and He would do mighty works, but the people would not repent. If you look with me real quickly to Matthew 11, verse 20, you will find uh, these words in Matthew 11 and verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. He did mighty works, did mighty miracles, but... They did not believe because they did not have ears to hear. Some sought to trick him so that they might have a reason to accuse him. Look quickly with me at Matthew 12, uh, verse 9. Matthew 12 and verse 9. Matthew 12, verse 9 says... And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogues. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him? He said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? They were trying to find some sort of uh, trick or accusation where they could lure Jesus into making a statement that would be contrary to the law. But they couldn't. He was the very reason that, uh, this reason that Jesus began teaching publicly in these parables, as we saw in chapter 13, verses 10 and through 13. The Bible uh, makes it clear, and the disciples came and said, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Because the lost would not hear it. And those who were trying to trick him, they wouldn't hear it. 
But those who had an earnest heart of belief, they would hear and listen, and the truth would set them free. You see, the problem that our Lord faced was that many people, though they had ears to hear, their ears had become hard of hearing. He mentions this, this in Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15, when he says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing we shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing we shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they shall see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Jesus told a parable that has come to be known as the parable of the sower, uh, because he had a message for those who had ears to hear. Jesus illustrated different reactions that people would have to the preaching of the gospel. And the parable itself is, as we've seen, there are several places you can look at it. Mark 4, 3 through 9, and Luke 8 also contain the message of this parable. In this parable, we actually have Jesus' own interpretation of what he was saying. The significance of this is enhanced by the words of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of Mark. I'd like to read this to you. Mark chapter uh, 4 and verse 13. Mark 4 verse 13. It says there, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how they will how then how will you know all parables? He says, He's speaking unto them, and if they did not understand this parable, then how would they understand other parables? So we see that the sower goes forth. This is an explanation of how we live our lives and we go out into the world and we share the gospel, we talk to people about God and about Christ and how to be saved, and many times we see that people reject our message. They mock our message. They don't want anything to do with it. But some will hear, and they will love the truth, and they will follow that truth. We see in this parable of the wheat and the tares that Jesus explains, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. And He does that through our lives. God is sovereign, but God uses men and women to carry out His work called human instrumentality. Uh, God is not looking for computers that He programs, but He works through people who love Him and have a heart to serve Him. And they produce much fruit. So it is likely that the sower in this parable had immediate reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we go in His name, we go in His power, we go in His strength. Without Him, we can do nothing. Now, the seed is the word of the kingdom or the word of God, as is recorded here in Matthew 13. And if you'll notice verse 19, I'll read it. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, notice, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart, his heart, this is he which receives seed by the wayside. The birds represent the wicked one called the devil. And you can read that in Luke 8, 12. Who snatches away the word from those whose hearts are hardened. Their condition, therefore, is one of being blinded by Satan. 
to the gospel. I'd really love for you to see this, and I'd like you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. take in just a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 and 4. Notice it says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, that's Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There's nothing that the devil loves more than to keep human beings in darkness. To blind your eyes so that you cannot see the message of life. Paul goes on and says, For we preach not ourselves, You see, it's not my opinion that counts. It's not your opinion that counts. But it's God's opinion that counts. I don't preach what I want to preach in my flesh. I'm led by the Spirit of God to go to His Word and seek His face and pray and then deliver the message from the Word of God. Not my words. God's words. But Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I've shared this many times. For a long time I would, I would go to church as a young boy. I would go to a Baptist church, I'd go to a Pentecostal, Methodist, you know, Presbyterians. I went to a lot of different churches, or so-called. And the day I got saved, at the age of 18, I was in a Baptist church. And the preacher that morning preached the gospel, and he told me that I was a sinner, reading from the Word of God, that I wasn't okay that I was bound for hell if I did not repent and turn to Christ. And that day, God led me to godly repentance. And I repented. Uh, I was listening to an interview they had with uh, Donald Trump, our former president. And he said, well, I try to live in such a way that I don't have to confess anything to God. The problem is that There are sins that we know about. There are sins we don't know about. They're called omission and commission. And there are many sins that we commit that we think about in our minds. The Bible says if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery already in his heart. So we can try to live as best we can, but we will still have sin. 1 John says, if you say that you have no sin, you are a liar, and the truth is not in you. No matter how good we try to live, we fall short. And that's why Christ died, that our sins might be put away and forgiven and never held against us. So when you repent and ask God to forgive you, And in godly sorrow you believe, you turn from sin and ask God to have mercy upon you. He does. And He changes your heart. He changes the way you think. He gives you a new heart and a new life. I remember when my dad got saved. How my dad used to be so rough and uh, times he would lose his temper and you know, throw things and slap me and do stuff uh, that were real bad. And But I knew Dad loved me, but he just didn't know how to act. And when he got saved for the first time in my life, 
at the age of almost 19, my dad said, Tony, I love you, son. And it was just like a, a, a dam breaking in my heart because my dad had never told me he loved me. And when the Lord saved him, he became a new man. When the Lord changes your life, the cussing stops. The vulgar language stops. The evil thoughts and all those things that are a part of our lives, God convicts us of those sins. And we want our lives to be pure and holy before Him in love. So he says that some hear the word, and notice if you would back to our text in Matthew 13 and verse 21. He says, Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by, he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns, he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. When I went to Bible college, we had uh, approximately 40-something students, freshmen, that entered Bible college. I mean, I graduated... Four years later, there wasn't a single student that started that was still in school. Not a lot hold out. And you watch people. You watch trouble come in their life or some little problem arise, and it may be big to them, and they can't hardly figure it out or harmonize it, so they think, well, I'll just forsake God. And I'll just do what I want to do or I'll hate God or be mad at God because of what's happened instead of just praising God and saying, Lord, I don't understand, but I'm going to trust You. And I'm going to know that You're going to work this out somehow. And He always does if you trust Him. My wife and I can say that He's never let us down, never failed us. Some hear the word and receive it with great joy, but with no root, they're not grounded in the word. I want to tell you something, and I hope you'll hear this. One of the most important things for a Christian is to be grounded in the word of God. If you're just a fly-by-night Christian and you don't study and apply yourself to the doctrines of the word of God, You'll have some Jehovah's Witness or some Mormon come in and they'll throw you all the way around the world. I mean, they'll mix you up completely. But if you know the Word and you're grounded in the truth, you're grounded in salvation by grace, you're grounded in baptism, you know what baptism is, you know what the Lord's Supper is, you know all of these things that God has commanded that's a very important thing Amen. to be grounded in the truth. Right. I noticed someone posting a, a, a Bible verse, and it wasn't a Bible verse, it was some, some uh, 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 transliteration. And they were posting it like it was the Word of God. And they don't know enough to know that that's not even the Word of God. And people are using these modern translations and they're all from a corrupt text. There's only one text that is pure and that's the Textus Receptus. That's the translation from the King James and the New King James. These other translations come from a corrupted text. Westcott Hort is the text. They take away verses from the Bible. They change the meaning of Scripture. And people who are grounded in the truth know better. But those who are not, they just fall right in line. Some hear the word and they rejoice, but then when problems come, they're not grounded. You see that there are different ways that people receive the word. And we need a strong foundation 
Anytime someone asks you a question, make sure that they answer you with the Word of God. Whenever you have a confusion about something, you go to the Word of God or you go to somebody who knows the Word of God who can show you from the book what God says. Not what my opinion is or someone what someone said, but what has God said. That's all that matters. We see some fell among thorns, the third soil. The soil represents the one who hears the word in Matthew 13, but the word uh, chokes because they do not have the ability to hear. Now, I want you to notice quickly, there are three things that get them. In Matthew 13, 22, it's the cares of the world. And I want to tell you something, the cares of this world will almost drive you out of your mind. If you have the burdens of this life laying on you and you're not giving them to the Lord, you're going to wear out real quick. You're, you can't handle that. You're not made for it. You see, God is made for it. That's why He says, Cast all your care upon me, for I careth for you. And we give it to Him and say, Lord, it's yours. I can't handle it. It's too big. It's out of my hands. And you trust Him in His time. So then you have the deceitfulness of riches in Matthew 13, 22. Oh, how deceitful riches are. How many people you know that uh, came into some money, you know, however they got it, they came into a bunch of money, and you watch them a year or so later and see how their life has completely changed. I've read several testimonies of people who won the lottery, and they said after they had won the lottery, it was the worst thing that had ever happened in their life. You'll say, well, how in the world would that be? I want to tell you something. If you don't know how to handle money, and all of a sudden money comes pouring in, and you just spend it hand over fist, it's going to run out real quick. And when it runs out, you're going to be in debt head over heels. Live within your means. If you can't pay for it, try to stay out of debt with everything within you. Because I can tell you about hundreds of marriages that had a good start, but because they could not manage money, they ended up in divorce. Be, be, be honest with each other. Tell each other what you spend. Tell each other what you have. Uh, work together. Don't try to hide stuff because in the end, it's not going to work. So we have the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of life from Luke 8, 14. Life can be very, very much enjoyable. I love to go fishing. Did a lot of it in my early years. Camping. Uh, I love to play sports. Basketball, baseball, football. Um, Lots of things you can enjoy in life. There's so many things. Flying a plane. You know, driving a fast car. Lots of things that are very enjoyable. But what we have to realize are these things are only temporary. I remember when I was seven, I wanted a pony. And I wanted a pony so bad that that was all I could think of. And I slept with my dad... Uh, for a while because we only had two bedrooms and the girls were in one bedroom the boys in the other and I'd wake up in the night and I would get a hold of my dad's ears and I'd act like I was riding a pony now I was fully conscious I knew what I was doing but he thought I was dreaming and I'd say get up horse get up horse and I'd be right over his ears and finally he said son I'm not going to be able to get a bit of sleep until I get you a pony and I said alright I got a pony. I remember wanting a mini bike. Got that. Got a motorcycle. Wanted a car. Got that. Had to work for it. But uh, these things were enjoyable. 
And a lot of times people just fall head over heels in the pleasure of this world. Nothing wrong with having a boat. Nothing wrong with going out on the lake. But when all you do is just go out on the lake and you don't go to church and you, you put the lake and your boat first, you're going to have trouble. It's going to come to you. I know because I've, I've had a little taste of it myself. We need to be aware of the pleasures of life. According to Luke 8, 14, these three can cause us to be unfruitful as we have seen. The cares of this world can cause us to be unprepared. The evil and cares and anxiety can drive us out of our right mind. The deceitfulness of riches is a great danger. Remember, the love of money is the root of all evil. Amen. Not money, but the love of money. And we need money to live, but when we get to the place where money becomes everything, we're surely going to miss the boat. Those things involving the flesh divert our minds from the things of God. That's what Galatians 5 is all about. It talks about the, the fruits of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the flesh will take over your life if you're not careful. Or you can follow the fruit of the Spirit and be blessed. Now as I close, I want us to keep in mind that there are many examples of people that were saved by God's grace and loved the Word. We remember about the Bereans and how they received the Word of God and they studied the Word to see whether these things were so. In Acts 17, 11, if you want to read it, it's a, it's a great example of the Bereans, how they loved the Word. And they bore fruit. Jesus made the, the connection in this parable and connects the two when He writes of how the Gospel produces fruit, even among the Colossians, and the Galatians, and all of those he had written to. When you understand that God and His Word are more important than all of the things of this world, then you're on the right track. What kind of fruit should we be producing? Well, we ought to be trying our best to win souls to Christ. Lead people to the Lord. Talk to them about how the Lord saved you and Tell them how to be saved. The Bible says, He that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of practical holiness. A man who walks in righteousness and lives before his children, the proper example, those children will admire you and look up to you and their lives will be changed because of, of the example of their parents. We have to, should have the fruit of sharing the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of good works, the fruit of praise and thanksgiving, Hebrews 13, 15. As we observe these things, our lives become fruitful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in closing, here's the question. What kind of soil are we? Are we the soil that, fall, that has fallen in the rocks? or the thorns, or on the road, the wayside? Are we the soil that's been choked by the, world, the worries of life? Or are we the soil where God has sown His seed and we have produced fruit? Some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some a hundredfold. I was reading the life of Adoniram Judson, who was a great missionary. And he went on the mission field, and he preached seven years. Seven years. And did not see one single convert. Not one person got saved. That's hard. He was on the mission field and he would write back to the churches and he would say, 
I've been preaching the gospel. I've been witnessing. Nobody's been saved. And he was faithful. And then a day came when revival broke out. And after seven long years of toil, the Lord began to save. And the church began to grow. And the Lord blessed him in such ways that he could only imagine. Adoniram Judson, you want to read the life of a man and his wife who served God and went through some horrible trials. Check it out. Read about Adoniram Judson. May God help us to bear fruit. May God help us not to be choked out by the cares of life or the worries or the riches, but to be true to Him. Thank you, Father, for your word, for your blessings. Pray now you'll apply it to our lives and hearts. If there be one here today who's not saved, and the Spirit of God has spoken to their heart, I pray that you would work in their lives and that they might come forward and openly confess Christ as their Lord and Savior. Or maybe it'll be tonight or tomorrow or some other day when you move. But I pray you would not allow anyone here to go to hell, but that everybody under the sound of my voice will one day be with the Lord in His eternal kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's all stand together, please. And Brother Philip. Yeah.